Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel, I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every single time that I upload. The case that I have for you all today happened long time ago. It is a very vintage case. It happened 91 years ago. But before we get into the case, I do have to say that today's video, we have a sponsor and this video is sponsored by one of my favorite companies to work with. You all probably already know who it's gonna be sponsored by. Magellan TV. If you are a regular viewer of my channel, then you may be familiar with this service. Magellan TV is a streaming service with over 3,000 documentaries and docuseries from some of the best filmmakers and networks from all around the world. They have a ton of different genres, but of course the true crime section is my favorite, and they add crazy 15 to 20 hours of new content every single week so us fans will never run out of content to watch and this content can be viewed anywhere or anytime it's compatible with most devices so you don't have to worry about that i always recommend a documentary from magellan tv and my recommendation is a documentary that i recently watched and it's called the family who vanished in february of the year 2003 five members of the Chohan family mysteriously vanished. A mother, a father, a grandmother, and two young children. A once happy family torn apart by evil. The three adults would be found washed up on a UK shore, but still to this day, the two children have never been found. The Family Who Vanished is a documentary that covers the tragic case of this family, a chilling case with a twisted motive of pure, greed and corruption that will leave you speechless and wanting even more answers. I have recommended so many documentaries and docuseries from Magellan TV. This is one of the ones, hands down, if you're going to get Magellan TV, if you already have it, watch this documentary because I had never heard of this case before. As soon as I saw that it was recently uploaded, I had to check it out. And this case will completely consume you. Even when you're done watching the documentary, you will want to know more. You will want to research more. It's just one of those cases. And right now, until December 31st, viewers can take advantage of a special holiday offer. You can get a buy one, get one free gift card for an annual membership by clicking on the link in the description of this video. Thank you Magellan TV for sponsoring yet again, another one of my videos. And with all that being said, let's get right to the case. Like I said at the beginning of this video, this is this, this is an old case. 91 years ago, this happened in the year 1930. And for how old it is, I'm surprised that there is this much information online about it. This is the case of Mary Agnes Moroni. Mary Agnes Moroni was born on May 9th of the year 1928 to parents Michael and Catherine Moroni. She had wavy blonde hair and very light sky blue eyes. The Moroni family was of Irish background and they were very proud of that. Mary's mother ended up marrying Michael at an extremely young age. Catherine was only 13 years old when she married Mary's father. In today's time, if a 13 year old got married and wanted to start a family, I'm not entirely sure how old Michael was. I could not find that information out, but obviously in today's time, that would be sickening and absolutely preposterous. But honestly, at that time, it was not looked at as weird. This family lived at 5200 Wentworth Avenue in Chicago, Illinois, and there are sources that claim different information when it comes to the family, but I'm going to go off of a newspaper article from the Oakland Tribune that was released on February 24th of 1952, over two decades after the case occurred, but we'll get into why it came out at that time and Overall, I just, I trust that source. Mostly because this source did talk directly to the family about stuff that was going on during that time. During early 1930, Catherine was 17 years old and she had Mary Agnes. She had her second daughter, Anastasia, and she was pregnant with her third child who would be named after her, Catherine. 
At this time, the Moroni family was not doing well financially at all, which of course, this was 1930, not a lot of families were doing very well, and this is not very surprising because it was during the Great Depression. The Great Depression was an economic depression that mostly started in the United States and then kind of spread worldwide. It began in 1929 and lasted well into the 1930s. Many families and businesses were affected by this financial disaster and the Moronis were no exception. They, they were definitely struggling. So Catherine had a two-year-old to take care of, a one-year-old to take care of, and was now pregnant with this new baby. And her husband was not making that much money. They decided to run an advertisement in the Chicago Daily Tribune for some help. Michael put the ad in the paper in the attempt to find a better job. A lot of people did this back then, they would state you know, how old they were, what area they lived in, and what type of work they were skilled in, in the hopes to find some work or better work so they could make some money until hopefully things got better for the country. I could not track down the original ad that was ran that day in the Chicago Tribune, so we do have to go off of public sources. Some sources did claim that in that ad, Michael asked also for material items things I guess that people could donate to him and his family, but most of all, he wanted a better job. The ad was ran in the newspaper in mid-May of 1930. The family let it out into the newspaper for anyone to come across and they just hoped for the best. When people ran ads like this in the newspaper during that time, you always had to kind of cross your fingers because there were so many people in need of help back then and so many individuals looking for work. Unless you had some insanely unique or very sought after skill, you would most likely be looked past. The year 1930 was only the beginning of this economic downfall and unfortunately in the next few years, it would only get worse. The suicide rates would skyrocket and families were even selling their own children. It was extremely heartbreaking. You also have to remember that this family was located in Chicago, Illinois, and this was a very populated area. So there was a lot of competition when it came to getting jobs. But on the day of May 14th, the Moronis thought they possibly were receiving a small answer to their prayers when an unknown visitor stopped by. Catherine at the time was scrubbing the floors of her home when there was a knock on the door. She had no idea who this could be. They weren't expecting any visitors. She got up and went to answer the door, having no idea what tragedy this would eventually lead to. She opens the door and a woman is standing there, a woman she has never seen before. This woman tells her that she has been sent by a social worker named Mrs. Henderson to help the family. She stated she was sent to deal with the family's case. Catherine was not familiar with a Mrs. Henderson, but figured they were simply responding to their ad that was run in the newspaper. Catherine didn't think anything was strange by this. She truly believed this woman was sent there to help and happily invited her into their home to speak with her more. This unknown woman comes inside. She has a whole bunch of groceries with her, even fresh vegetables, sits them on the kitchen table looks over at the freshly cleaned floor and says to Catherine, my, my, but you're ambitious, basically complimenting her cleaning skills. She and Catherine start a bit of a lengthy conversation from there. Catherine is at this point confiding in this woman that she just met, telling her all about the family's current struggles. Apparently this woman was easy to warm up to and that is exactly what Catherine did. She warmed up to her and talks and talks and talks and I'm sure she felt so relieved that someone was there to finally help them. This woman listened and she comforted Catherine. It was said that this woman was beautiful in looks, very sweet, she was well-dressed, she had very kind eyes, she was very soft-spoken, and that she sounded quite intelligent and very cultured. The family did not know her exact age, but from a source of mine, she was described by Catherine as being in her early 20s, like 22, 23 years old. And when it came to physical characteristics, she did have teeth that were described as protruding. 
During this visit though, the woman spotted little Mary Agnes close by. And as soon as she saw this little girl, her face lit up. She was taken aback. It was like she had never seen an adorable little child before. Catherine though really didn't think much of this at the time because Mary was a cute little girl and people were always rushing over to pick her up and pinch her cheeks and say how precious she was. But after what would eventually happen, she would see how odd this woman's behavior truly was at the time. And one strange thing about this that I have to point out is that there was Mary Agnes, but there was also Anastasia who was a year old at the time. And this woman, it would kind of be a little bit different if she was like, oh my goodness, like both of your children are so cute. But she only focused in on Mary Agnes. She basically said nothing about Anastasia. It was just Mary Agnes. It was like she had this strange immediate fascination, which is like one of the children. Then things get so much weirder. This woman, this woman that Catherine just met, she asks Catherine if she can take Mary Agnes all the way to California for a few weeks. Keep in mind, this was not a family member. This was not a close friend. This was a woman who just met this little girl and is asking to take her halfway across the country on a trip. This woman tells Catherine that if she could take Mary Agnes and have this fun little trip to Cali, that she'll make sure that Mary Agnes eats so well. She tells Catherine that her daughter will literally be unrecognizable when she gets back because she'll have eaten so well, she'll be like a little butterball. And Catherine, you know, she's kind of taken aback, but she wants to be polite. And she says, you know, that, that's kind and all, but no, I, I don't really feel comfortable with that. The woman doesn't go on much more about it, but says she'll be back soon. As she is leaving, Catherine realizes she never actually got the woman's name. So she asks her her name and the woman replies, Julia Otis, Mrs. Julia Otis. And she gives Catherine $2 and leaves. So this Julia Otis woman said that she'd be back and she did come back the very next day on May 15th. And she arrives with not only more groceries, but also some baby clothes. It seemed like Julia was really trying to get on Catherine's good side to really earn her trust because she was bringing the things that they, they needed the most. Although the whole trip to California thing did strike Catherine as very odd, she felt like Julia had the best intentions. Unfortunately, she would be very wrong. Now, not only did Julia bring these gifts for the family, but she also brought good news. Julia claimed she might possibly have a great job lined up for Michael. I mean, she basically comes in with everything, everything they want there, everything they need, and everything they wanna hear. And this family is absolutely ecstatic. I mean, the job thing is basically the main thing that they wanted to hear. And a little bit of time, goes by, a little chatting goes on, and Julia asks Catherine if she can possibly take Mary Agnes out to get her some clothes. I know my subscribers so well. I know you all are sitting there literally like, do not trust this Julia Otis chick. Like, just don't trust her. And you all are right. This Julia Otis, she wants to take Mary Agnes to do a little bit of clothes shopping. Julia had helped them out so much and Catherine felt like she could trust this woman enough to take her daughter out for a little shopping. Keep in mind that it was believed that Julia truly was sent by a social worker. So Catherine, she tells Julia, yes. This next part, I don't even have a child myself. This part completely breaks my heart. Mary Agnes, little, little girl, was definitely not comfortable with this woman because as soon as Julia picks her up, Mary Agnes starts crying and screaming and reaching for her mom. The last thing little Mary Agnes says is mama and she is crying out for her mother. That is the last thing that her mother heard her child say. Catherine tries to comfort her little girl a little and tells her it's okay. Julia leaves with Mary Agnes out the door and Neither of the two were ever seen by the Moroni family again. Hours and hours pass at the Moroni home and Catherine, of course, starts to worry. 
yes, maybe Julia took Mary Agnes out for lunch as well. Maybe they're taking a little longer with shopping. Maybe Julia needed to stop somewhere else, but it shouldn't be taking this long. As time ticks by, Catherine starts getting the feeling that something is very wrong and that she shouldn't have let her two-year-old go with this woman that she just met. It gets later in the day and Michael gets home from his job. Catherine tells him what is going on and they decide to phone the police. So authorities head over to the home and speak with both Catherine and Michael to get the full story. And they're trying to get the best description of this Julia Otis character as they can, but Catherine can only really give them so much. She says that this woman looked, like I said before, 22 to 23 years old. She was about five foot two inches tall and weighed about 125 pounds. She states that she was wearing a gray suit with some blue trimming and a lace hat and that she had on a pearl necklace and a wristwatch. Catherine tells authorities all that she can remember about this Julia person. And she also tells them about how the day before, Julia was very insistent on taking Mary Agnes to California. And this definitely is something that sticks out to police. So they decide to check anyone with a similar description to the woman who may be boarding a bus or train out to California from that area, especially someone fitting that description who has a small child with them, but they are unable to locate anyone. But a few witnesses would come forward afterwards, claiming to have seen a woman fitting this Julia's description. They saw her during the day of May 15th in a restroom of a store in downtown Chicago, and she was with a little girl, and she was strangely dictating a letter to an older woman. So she was basically telling this older woman what to write in the letter. They never found out who this older woman was, whether this Julia woman used the older woman to write the letter to hide her own handwriting, or if the older woman was actually involved in some way. But the letter would make an appearance. There would actually be two letters though. The first letter arrived at the Moroni home the day after the abduction on May 16th of 1930. The letter read, please don't be alarmed. Any letter that starts out with, please don't be alarmed, is probably referring to something that you should be alarmed by. Anyways, please don't be alarmed. I have taken your little girl to California with me. I have hired a special nurse to care for her. We'll be back in two months. By that time, you will be on your feet again and we'll be able to care for her. She didn't even cry a bit. She is outfitted like a princess. In the meantime, I'll help all I can to get you on your feet. Don't worry about her or anything else. When you get this letter, we'll be on our way already. As ever, Julia Otis. I'm not even a parent myself, but if somebody took my little girl and left me a letter like that, I'd be having my first mugshot. Now that would be the last time that the Moroni family ever heard from this Julia Otis. Remember how in the letter she was basically like, you know, I'll help you all that I can, like until you get on your feet. Like she never wrote again, she never sent any money, nothing like that. That was the last time they ever heard from this Julia Otis. After they received the letter, they obviously handed it over to authorities. And as horrible as it was that this unknown woman possibly took their child all the way to California, they honestly hoped that she would be tracked down or at least she would eventually return the child. The woman stated that little Mary Agnes would be returned in two months and they prayed that she actually would be. This letter though was very vague and it didn't even say where in California they may have gone. So they just, they didn't have a lot to go off of. The Moroni family just, they hoped at this time, maybe this woman and Mary Agnes would be spotted somewhere on their journey out there or in California and they could get their daughter back. Then two weeks after receiving the first letter, the family received another. This letter claimed to be written by Mrs. Henderson, the social worker that Julia Otis claimed she was sent by. This letter was written in a similar handwriting to the first, and in this letter, this Mrs. Henderson said that Julia Otis was her cousin. In this letter, this Mrs. Henderson claimed that Julia had Two horrible tragedies occur in the past year, the first one being the sudden death of her baby girl and the second being the sudden death of her husband. 
She said that Julia was simply a devastated mother that wanted to mother a little girl for some time and that their daughter would be returned to them. One direct quote from the letter was, Mrs. Otis had pined for the company of a child due to losing her own. And that is why she took your little girl. So authorities started searching for this Mrs. Henderson, whose first name was said to be Alice. They were never able to locate this Alice Henderson. It seemed like this was just a made up name and definitely not the name of an actual social worker anywhere around that area. And of course they had already looked into any Julia Otis's and it seemed like that was a made up name as well. Months and months passed and Mary Agnes was never returned to her loving family, but they still held hope she would be back one day. It became apparent that this unknown woman was not going to actually return their child and their only hope was someone spotting her wherever she may have ended up with their little girl they missed dearly. I know there's probably a lot of my subscribers out there because you all are little detectives and I freaking love it, but I know there's some people out there that are probably like, well, what if Mary Agnes's parents just made up the whole thing? What if there was no Alice Henderson? What if there was no Julia Otis? Well, this is something that authorities considered for a very brief period of time. According to a newspaper article released by the Sarasota Herald Tribune on May 21st of 1930, Michael and Catherine were actually arrested the night before on the 20th for a short time because Police said there were several unusual circumstances with the story told by the parents. The paper said they believed both the letters sent from Mrs. Otis and the one supposed to be sent by Mrs. Henderson were of the same writing. Authorities expressed the fear the child might have been killed accidentally or otherwise, and that a friend of the family's named William Conrode was being looked into and questioned. Now that was pretty much all of the information out there when it comes to suspicion laying on the parents. Michael and Catherine were released from custody and authorities were unable to find any evidence that they did anything to their little girl. And there was nothing else really said about this family friend. So I would say that he was not looked at as a solid suspect. More and more months pass and we're at about a year after Mary Agnes's disappearance and there would be a little spark in this case, again. In July of 1931, a Native American woman named Martha Thompson in Rockford, Illinois, was seen pushing a cart with a little girl in it. And apparently this little girl looked a lot like Mary Agnes. Martha Thompson was arrested on suspicion of possessing a kidnapped child. She told authorities that the child was abandoned by her biological mother. This mother's name was said to be Florence Fuller and this woman begged to keep the little girl. Well, Catherine Maroney is notified about this and she heads to Rockford to see the little girl in person and she gives the little girl one look and she says, that is not my baby. And that was that. I'm not sure what happened to this little girl, but in the end, it was not Mary Agnes. Through the years, many newspaper articles were ran in different papers about the case, but this case would ultimately be at a bit of a standstill for a little over two decades. And what would happen in the year 1952, in all honesty, it looked extremely promising, but in the end, it wouldn't turn out how they hoped. On Sunday, February 24th of the year 1952, the Oakland Tribune released an article about the disappearance of Mary Agnes Maroney. The Maroney family went on to have five boys after the birth of their third child, who Catherine was pregnant with at the time Mary Agnes disappeared. Photos of the seven children were put in the article in the hopes that possibly if a woman out there around the age of 24 years old who doesn't know her biological parents and kind of looks like the other children could come forward and see if she was Mary Agnes. This newspaper was located in California and that is the main place that they targeted because that is where this Julia Otis woman said she was taking Mary Agnes. Well, a young auto mechanic named Everett McClelland, residing in San Pablo, California, saw this article. And as soon as he saw it, it was like a little light bulb went off in his brain. All he could think about 
was how his wife looked so much like the missing girl's siblings. His wife, named Mary McClelland, yes, Mary, was 24 years old and was adopted. This wasn't one of those circumstances where the person was like, oh my gosh, I have to be this missing little girl. That's definitely me, 100%. I mean, Mary McClelland, she really had no idea. And when her husband came to her with this newspaper, she was like, I mean, that could be me. I mean, I don't know if it is, but like it could be. So Everett and Mary went to the authorities with their suspicion. Now you have to remember that this was a time far before DNA testing. Today, we would just do a DNA test and bing, bang, boom, we would see if it was a match. But back then, they had other ways of possibly seeing if two individuals were related. But none of them were ways to 100% prove it. You get what I mean. But they decide they're going to do all the testing they can to see if this Mary, Mary McClelland, is the Mary that they have been looking for. At this time, Mary McClelland and the Maroney family were just not entirely sure if she was Mary Agnes, but they were, they were just waiting to see the results. According to an article released by the Sarasota Herald Tribune on September 5th of 1952, an anthropologist from the University of Arizona named Dr. Krauss was given a cast of Mary McClelland's teeth along with 33 other casts of women's teeth and all these casts were unmarked. And he immediately selected Mary's as having the most similar characteristics as the teeth of the Maroney family. So all in all, she had very similar teeth to all of the Maroney's. And according to that same article, other scientists also looked at Mary McClelland's fingerprints and handprints and said they were very similar to the Maroney family. And she also had the same blood type. There would be some factors though that would pop up and create a little bit of a bump in the road for this. For one, a chief of detectives in Chicago received a telegram from a woman claiming to be Mary McClelland's foster mother. This woman claimed that she witnessed the birth of Mary McClelland and adopted her as a baby in November of 1927, which 1927 would have been over two years before Mary Agnes was kidnapped. Also, a doctor came forward and claimed to have witnessed the delivery of Mary McClelland himself, also in the year of 1927. But no paperwork was ever brought forward of the adoption or birth, so officials didn't know whether to believe it or not. But one huge thing is that Chicago police records did show that as a baby, Mary Agnes had a surgery for a ruptured navel and this would have left a scar and Mary McClelland did not possess the scar on her body. Nonetheless, the Maroney family, they, they really wanted to meet Mary McClelland and they did in September of 1952. The Maroney family, they were just very torn because there was no way to prove if she was a member of their family and, and time had passed, so many years had went by, they didn't know how Mary Agnes would actually look when she was older, so this could possibly be her. And there were so many factors that you looked at and it was like, okay, this might be her. And there were so many factors where it was like, okay, it might not be her, but in the end they, they wanted to meet her. And right here is a photo of Mary McClelland and Anastasia Maroney. So you all can see the similarities between McClelland and the biological sister, Mary Agnes. As you can tell, there are quite a lot of similarities. When Catherine Maroney met Mary McClelland, she really didn't know what to think because of course a mother knows her child, but this was 22 years after her daughter was kidnapped. A human changes drastically in 22 years. To Catherine, her heart wanted to believe this was her daughter, but her head knew that the chances were slim and there was no definite proof of that yet. The family did stay close though with Mary McClelland through the years. Mary McClelland, she would end up passing away in the year 2005 and four years after that, in the year 2009, a DNA test was finally done to compare the DNA of McClelland to the Maroney family. And it was discovered that Mary McClelland was not 
Mary Agnes. So basically, for over five decades, almost six decades, this family was unsure if this woman was actually Mary Agnes. And this woman was unsure if she was Mary Agnes as well for almost six decades. So that is the case of Mary Agnes Moroni. And this was definitely one of those cases that sent me down a rabbit hole. I should really get some sort of merch with like a rabbit going down a hole because I use that phrase so often, but I dove pretty deep on this one and I will list all my sources down below if you want to check those out and possibly see some firsthand information. But unfortunately, due to how old this case is, so much information and so many articles were just never uploaded to the internet or some of the pages with these articles have been taken down over time. And as we know, with older cases, information, it can, be, it can become very skewed. So I definitely tried to do my best with this one. A large portion of people who look into this case believe that Julia Otis and Alice Henderson were of course false names. I believe that myself. I think most of you believe that as well. And that Mary Agnes was most likely taken by this woman and possibly raised by her. And that Mary Agnes grew up and maybe she just knew no different. Maybe she didn't know that she was adopted. Maybe she didn't remember her life with her actual family. Due to the effort that this woman put into abducting Mary Agnes, most people who look into this case don't believe that she was just abducted and killed. I mean, she might have been abducted and then sold, but most people do not believe that she was abducted and then killed. Also due to the Great Depression, you know, people did sell children for money to families who wanted a child, especially financially well off families. So the selling thing, that very well could have happened. Most people also do not believe that Catherine and Michael had anything to do with Mary Agnes's disappearance. I mean, they would go on to have seven children, not including Mary Agnes, who was the oldest. And all of the children seem to be very loved and taken care of. So I just, I truly don't believe that something happened to Mary Agnes and they were just covering something up and went on with this huge story and fabricated all of this. Like, I, I just personally don't believe that myself. And I know that some people out there may be wondering why they went on to have so many children when they were financially struggling, but apparently things did get a lot better for them financially. So they did go on to have a, a pretty big family. I also know that a huge talking point about this case is the letters, which I mean, the first letter in particular. I found no information about whether the letters though had any addresses or postmarks, nothing along those lines. I could not find that information anywhere. And considering witnesses spotted the woman with the child in the restroom of the store in Chicago dictating what to write in the letter, the day of the kidnapping, I don't see how the letter, the first letter, would have been sent out that day and received by the Moroni family the very next day. But some people online did say that male, ran a little bit faster back then and that maybe if the letter was dropped off you know in a post office box somewhere in a mailbox somewhere in that area possibly it could have gotten to their house by the next day i don't know i mean when you think about it it had to have been through the mail because somebody coming that night to drop off that letter or earlier the next day to drop off that letter it would have been extremely risky. So, I mean, it had to have been through the mail, right? Web sleuths online have worked for years and many people have posted in different forums and message boards about how they think, you know, this person or this person could be Julia Otis or Mary Agnes, but nothing has ever been verified completely. It is, it just, it's devastating that she was taken from her family, but, we have to just hope that she didn't face a cruel and tragic end to her life. And maybe, maybe she's still out there. Maybe she lived a full life. Maybe she just didn't know about her original one. Maybe she grew up and started her own family. Maybe she's buried somewhere under a different name, a name she was given after she was taken. I mean, we never know, but let me know what you think about this case. I'm always curious what everybody has to say because 
I tried to gather as much information as I could online about this case. So if you have any questions down below, I pretty much posted everything that I know about this case in this video. So all that you all know about this case is all that I know about this case, but I would definitely like to dive into some theories. I hope that everyone's November is going good though. Stay safe out there and I will see you all in the next one.